Hello and welcome back to Math 301 Combinatorics at CSU. This is a supplementary video to the chapter on combinatorial proofs that we've been looking at. And we've discussed bijections. And I want to talk to a little bit more about bijections and cardinality of sets, even if the sets in question are not necessarily finite. So this is just developing a little more of the theory of bijections so you can see uh, some of their properties and their use. So a bijection, let's recall, between sets A and B is a function from A to B that is one-to-one -one and onto. And these are fancy ways of saying it's a direct correspondence. But one-to-one -one means that if f of x equals f of y, then x actually equals y, which means you can't have two different points in A mapping to the same point of B. That's not allowed. So if you have two different points here, they have to go to different points over in B here. And uh, that's encoded by this statement because if they did go to the same place, actually they must have been the same. Now onto means that every element of B is hit by some arrow. Every, for every Y and B, there's some X and A that maps to it under F. So that means it's a one-to-one -one and onto correspondence, and it's a perfect matching between the elements of A and the elements of B. Now let's look at uh, an important theorem about bijections that's useful in proving a lot of facts about them, and also useful in knowing when you have a bijection between two sets. If you have some mapping, when do you know it's a bijection? Well, an easy way to tell is that f is a bijection if and only if it has an inverse. And an inverse is a function g from b to a that reverses the map. So f of g of b is b for any b in here, and g of f of a is back to a for any a in here. What that means is that if you draw it as a, a diagram of arrows, for these finite sets, for instance, then the inverse is just given by reversing the arrows and uh, making them go backwards. And so that's how you can think of the inverse function. It's going to be a function because it's a bijection. And so all these points have exactly one arrow coming into them. So they have exactly one arrow coming out of them. So this theorem comes in handy for proving things like the following. So if we write A is equivalent to B, let's define a, a relation. A is equivalent to B. If there's a bijection, from A to B, if just there exists some bijection out there somehow. Um, so that, that relation is actually an equivalence relation on sets in the sense that it satisfies the three properties of equivalence relations that we've discussed before. And those three properties are reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Reflexive says that any set is related to itself. So is there a bijection between any set A and itself? Yes, the, the bijection that sends any element X to itself x just goes to x itself, then that's a, that's a bijection because you, it inverses itself. Um, so that's reflexive. Symmetric says that if a is equivalent to b, then b is equivalent to a. And indeed, if there's a bijection from a to b, then its inverse is a bijection from b to a. And finally, is it transitive? If a is equivalent to b and b is equivalent to c, that means there's a bijection from a to b and a bijection from b to c. And we can take their composite just follow the arrows from A all the way to C to get a bijection from A to C. And indeed, the inverse of a composite G composed with F is what that composite function is called, is actually the inverse of F composed with the inverse of G, meaning you follow G backwards and you follow the F arrows backwards, and that reverses the whole bijection. So we have an equivalence relation defined by the existence of bijections between sets. And so when we have an equivalence relation, we want to look at equivalence classes. And the equivalence classes under this, budget, this relation are called cardinalities. A cardinality is an equivalence class of sets under bijection. So let's look at some examples of cardinalities. Let's look at the cardinality of the empty set. The empty set is only in bijection with itself and no other sets. So we'll call that cardinality zero with a little underline to distinguish it from the number zero. The cardinality zero just consists of the empty set. The cardinality of one consists, consists of all sets of size one. That entire class of sets is one cardinality. And similarly, two consists of the class of all sets of size two. It's an enormous number of sets. Any, any two things um, represents the number two. Similarly, n is the uh, class of all sets of size n, and we write size of a equals n if a is in that cardinality, if it's a member of that equivalence class. So the fun thing here is now we can compare infinite cardinalities. So finite cardinalities is where we do combinatorics to figure out how many elements are in a set. But how many elements are in an infinite set, and are they different at all from each other? Let's look at the infinite sets n, z, q, r, and c, some of our favorite ones. 
Um, let's first look at n and z. I claim these are the same size in the sense that there's a bijection between n and z. So this may seem unintuitive because you'd think the natural numbers are co contained in the integers as a subset. They can't be as big. But th strange things happen in infinity. And in fact, in order to make a bijection between 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera, and the integers, we just need to list the integers in some order. Let's list them as 0, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 2, 3, minus 3, et cetera, and just make the bijection by just drawing an arrow from the next number to the next number in the sequence. So anything that can be listed in order is in bijection with the natural numbers. And z can be listed in order. And so, uh, so every element of z is in this list, and so it's a bijection. So the natural numbers and the integers are actually the same size of infinity. So are the natural numbers and the rationals, it turns out. So the natural numbers, again, are 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, the counting numbers. And the rational numbers, we can write as the set of all a over b fractions, so that a and b are both in the integers, and b is greater than or equal to 1, so that we're not dividing by 0, and the negative sign is always in the a. And also, gcd of a, b equals 1. We, we say they're relatively prime, just so that we, we have a reduced fraction. So we're not listing 2 over 4 as different from 1 over 2. So now, can we list all of the elements of the rational numbers in some order? It seems pretty hard. But when we think about it, let's start with 0, and let's list them in order of the sum a plus b. Let's first consider the smallest possible sum a plus b can be. That would be 2. We can have 1 over 1, and then the negative of that as well, just like we did for z, minus 1 over 1. Now, if the sum of the a and b is 3, we could have 2 over 1, and it's negative, uh, minus 2 over 1 or 1 over 2, and then we list its negative, minus 1 over 2. OK, that's all the possibilities where a plus b is 3. What about if a plus b is 4? Well, we can have um, 3 over 1 and minus 3 over 1, You know, we're just negating 1 over 3 and minus 1 over 3. We can't have 2 over 2 because that's not reduced. That's the same as 1 over 1. We're going to skip that because of the GCD condition. We don't want to list an element twice, after all. For sum equal to 5, we have 4 over 1, and it's negative. 3 over 2, and it's negative. And then um, 2 over 3 actually does work, so we get more possibilities in this case. These are relatively prime. Negative 2 over 3, 1 over 4, and negative 1 over 4. And that's sum equal to 5. Then you list the ones with sum equal to 6, etc. Notice that every single rational number is on this list. We didn't miss any because every rational number has some sum of its numerator and denominator, and so it, it eventually is reached by this list. So then we can make the bijection where 0 maps to 0, and 1 maps to 1 over 1, and 2 maps to minus 1 over 1, and so on, because we listed them in order. So the natural numbers and the rationals have exactly the same size. But interestingly, the, the natural numbers and the reals do not have the same size. The reals are actually a bigger size of infinity than all the three sets we looked at before. And the proof of this is a classic proof by contradiction. It's called Cantor's diagonal argument. And the proof by contradiction says we're going to assume it's true and show that something goes terribly wrong. So let's assume that the real numbers can be listed in order. That's what we need to have a bijection with the natural numbers. So let's list them as some integers n1, n2, n3, point, and this is in decimal form. So d11, d12, d13, et cetera, are just decimal digits between 0 and 9. So this is writing, writing our numbers out as decimals. This is our list of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, and now we consider the, the number formed by changing each of the diagonal digits. So this, take d11, d22, d33, take the diagonal, and make a new decimal where you change the, each digit where d11 hat is you add 1 cyclically wrapping around mod 10. Um, you have to worry a little bit sometimes with 0.9 bar formats, but there's always a way of changing all these digits so that you make a new number and this number can't be on this list because it's different from every one of these numbers in the list by some DII, um, because we changed each of those diagonal elements. And that gives us a contradiction, because we said that we listed, we assumed that we listed all real numbers, and we created a real number out of that list that's actually not on the list. And so um, this gives us a contradiction. R is not on the list. Uh, so we have a contradiction, and that means our original assumption that R can be listed in order is false. And so we can't make a bijection between the natural numbers and the real numbers. The real numbers are just too big. We can, in fact, state this a little more precisely. 
um, by saying the size of n is actually less than the size of r in the sense that there's a one-to-one -one function from the natural numbers to the real numbers, given by just mapping every natural number to itself. So no two elements here go to the same element there. So it's contained as a subset, in other words. But that's not an onto map. And so that doesn't show it's equal, which is good because they're not equal sizes. Um, but it does show that, that this is what we mean by two cardinalities being less than, or, or you know, comparable to each other, if one can be sort of embedded in the other. So this, this allows us to generate more infinite cardinalities with a theorem that's rather hard to prove. We're not going to do it in this video, but if you take the power set of a set to be the set of all subsets of that set, it turns out that the set, the size of a, of a set A is always less than the size of its power set. So you can use this to keep constructing bigger and bigger sets of, of infinite sizes by just keeping taking power sets. So as a fun exercise for you to try, you can try to prove that the size of the real numbers equals the size of the complex numbers, which is the one uh, classic set that we haven't talked about yet. And to do this, the challenge is to find a bijection between the real numbers and the complex numbers. And somewhat surprisingly, they are actually the same size. And that's all for today, and we'll see you next time.